Hello everyone and welcome to this new video about the release highlights uh, about the SAS 13.2 and especially about the inventory and purchase apps. I apologize already in advance about the sound uh, recording, but unfortunately we uh, do not have access at the time uh, to the Odoo Studio uh, given the current circumstances. Um, but we hope that we will be, of course, back uh, soon in this uh, studio for better uh, recording conditions. But that being said, we are going to see together what are the new features, changes, and um, refactoring that happened on the inventory and purchase apps and that the product owners brought to us with the new uh, SAS release 13.2. Uh, so we're going to see first what are the changes that uh, we have on the batch picking. The, there was a big refactoring on the batch picking. Um, and the idea here was that uh, we wanted to show uh, the detailed operations uh, grouped onto a single picking view, meaning that if you decide to group several pickings into one batch transfer, you can more easily transfer and see what are the products to be taken from the different locations and that directly uh, within the barcode view. So let's see uh, yeah, on RunBot, uh, what are the consequences of the recent changes uh, that were made. So first we're going to check that we have uh, enough inventory for let's say a uh, large cabinet, uh, which is uh, the, this product uh, with 100 on hand in shelf one and 100 on end in shelf two. So we do have enough uh, for this product. And we can check also the cable management box. As you can see here, we have 10 on end uh, for the lot uh, 001 for uh, in shelf two for the cable management box. So now what we are going to do is to create, uh, let's say, two three sales orders just to have some data uh, here. Um, so we are going to sell large cabinets uh, for, let's say, 20 units and the cable management box for five units. We can confirm. Uh, we have a delivery order which is created, of course. We can duplicate that uh that's information um we can say that next time we're going to sell 40 and three uh, large cabinet confirm again um and then uh, let's have a final uh, delivery order uh, and we will sell two and let's say 20 if we check uh, on the last sales orders, the delivery order that we have, it's fully booked, fully ready to be uh, delivered. It comes from uh, shelf two. And if we check again, uh, the list of delivery orders that we have in the company ready to be uh, processed, and we check the last ones that we created uh, with the different SOs, they are all ready to deliver uh, from different locations. So now the idea is that we are going to create a batch transfer with the three different orders that we uh, created today. Uh, you can do that, for instance, if you want to prepare at the same time um, the three different delivery orders because they have the same uh, scheduled date, for instance. And then you use the option add to batch on top of the transfers. You can either add the delivery orders that you have selected onto an existing batch transfer or you create a new batch transfer. Here in that situation, what we are going to do is that we are going to create a new batch uh, transfer. And we can select one of our uh, employee to be the responsible for the batch transfer. Then we can confirm um, the uh, batch transfer. And you can see here on the right that it has been added to batch transfer number four. And if we double check uh, in the batch transfers list, we have a draft batch transfer that is created uh, that summarizes the delivery orders that we have selected to be processed together. And we now have the possibility to actually confirm this batch transfer. And as soon as we confirm the batch transfer, you see that it groups into one view all the stock moves that are related to the different transfers. 
and also all the um, stock move lines or detailed operations that are related uh, to this transfer, meaning also the locations where we have to pick uh, the items uh, for the delivery to happen. And as you can see here, it regroups the different um, products to be uh, taken and ordered by uh, location. So the operator, it will be easier for the operator, meaning that it, it just needs to go uh, first to the shelf one, pick the large cabinet for 20 units, and then he knows that he has to move onto shelf two for the five remaining products. And he doesn't care at this stage uh, for which uh, delivery order it is, because it's just a matter of picking the items. Um, <clears throat> if we double check actually uh, how it looks like in the barcode app now, you can see that there is a new menu that has been added in the barcode app uh, where you can directly open the batch transfers. And here I can directly open uh, the batch transfer uh, number, number four. And as you can see, the information is grouped by uh, products to be picked, uh, which is interesting uh, because I can see that I need to take in shelf one 20 units of the large cabinet. And I see that in shelf two, I have to take uh, different units uh, of different products, but also it is grouped uh, by uh, delivery order. So as you can see here, I have my delivery order 21 in red, and I have the delivery order 22 uh, in uh, green, and then I have um, the number 23 in some kind of uh, purple and blue uh, color. So as you can see, it's also easier, uh, thanks to this new view that is adapted to the barcode uh, scanner, to actually process the goods, to go location by location, and also to see, uh, I would say, um, delivery order by delivery order, or picking by picking, uh, what are uh, the items that needs to be picked. So it really eases uh, the process of picking the items uh, through the batch transfer, and it makes more sense now to create it. So you can either uh, do it by processing it uh, through uh, the barcode application, if you do it one by one, or you can do a mass validation by using the validate button here uh, on um, the batch transfer. And you can, of course, uh, confirm uh, the transfer uh, by just validating it here uh, directly on the batch transfer. So as you can see, I was able to actually uh, validate in one go um, the batch transfer. Um, that's, I would say, the main thing about it, meaning that you can regroup the pickings into one batch transfer, you can process them through the barcode app or in mass. Uh, and the idea is that it helps you to better see or, uh, which one you need to process first and for which uh, delivery order it is. So that's uh, really interesting uh, as it is uh, now. Of course, if you have an existing uh, batch transfer that you haven't processed yet, you can still uh, cancel it which means that you will release um, the transfer that was attached to it and you can again decide to uh, put uh, the transfer number three for instance back in another uh, batch picking uh, by uh, adding it to a new batch transfer and as you can see it has been transferred from batch uh, number three to uh, batch number five so that's about it for the batch pickings uh, which i believe is a great addition especially when you think about everything related to uh, batch picking or uh, wave uh, picking waves uh, that could be used, especially uh, during the picking process when you need to pick uh, several items at a time for different uh, orders. So now the application is, is quite, quite interesting and it can be used in the barcode. The next uh, addition that we have in the SAS 13.2 is the um, uh, changes that were applied for the, the lead time and link for the reordering rules. So I don't know if you remember, but uh, in the past versions on the reordering rules, what you had is that you had the opportunity uh, somewhere here next to the procurement group to decide uh, of a certain lead time uh, that would be applied uh, on the reordering rule. Uh, it was saying days at purchase or days uh, within the reordering rules. And no, it's not available anymore. And there is kind of a new behavior that has been put into place uh, for the 
your ordering rules. But the first step for me here uh, will be to make sure that I'm applying the standard lead times in my inventory. So I have the security lead time, of course, meaning that I want to take some kind of security on my total uh, time frame that I have to order my products to take uh, some slack uh, in order to make sure that I want I will have enough time to deliver on time the items. So I will um, uh, forward port kind of uh, or backward port here in that case um, the schedule date to make sure that I receive them uh, on time. And I have the days to purchase, which is the time that it takes me to actually uh, confirm a request for quotation that would be created automatically by the system. So I'm going to say that I have a security lead time of two days for my purchases, and I have one day, uh, it takes me one day uh, to actually confirm my PO. So keep that in mind. I have two days for my security lead time, uh, one day uh, for my days to purchase. That's, of course, uh, the generic uh, scheduling that I'm going to apply for the purchasing uh, in my inventory. But what I'm going to do as well, I'm going to create a product with a supplier lead time because uh, beyond the lead time that I have internally and that I want to set for my company, I have also the external times uh, that I, uh, and external lead times that I have with my uh, suppliers that I can't uh, actually control and manage, which are dependent on uh, my suppliers um, abilities. So here I'm going to create uh, MRI product RR. Um, it's a storable one, of course. What matters here is to set a vendor. So let's say that I'm going to buy this to Acer um, for a certain price. And I'm, of course, going to add the delivery lead time. And I'm going to say that it takes uh, four days for my suppliers uh, to actually do the delivery of the product. So if I do a quick reminder here of the lead times that I've said, I have a security lead time of two days. I have a purchase validation time, which is of one day. I have a delivery lead time of four days, which means that in total, I expect um, my, my, my order to take seven days in total including the time it takes me to um, validate the PO, including the time it takes uh, for my supplier uh, to deliver the goods, and uh, including the time uh, that I want to set myself as a security uh, buffer uh, onto my supply chain. So it's seven days in total. Um, so what I'm going to do as well is that I'm going to uh, say that I have uh, some products uh, on end, let's say five uh, units uh, on end. And now I'm rather going to say that I have uh, 10 units on end, and I'm going to create a reordering rule on the product on my main uh, stock location in my main warehouse, a reordering rules of a minimum quantity of five. So how is it going to work uh, now uh, that I have uh, changed and created my reordering rule for 5.5? Five? It has changed because now it is going to take into account the lead times that I have set up on my product. Meaning that uh, the reordering rule is going to check that within the total lead time to uh, supply my product, meaning here seven days, I have enough units and I won't uh, go below the minimum quantity that I have set here, meaning that my forecasted quantity for my product within the next seven coming days is not going to go below uh, the minimum quantity of five. The reordering rule is not going to be triggered. So now the reordering rule takes into account uh, the lead time, the total lead time, purchase lead time that you have with this product to know whether it needs to be triggered or not. Uh, and that's uh, the little information that you have here that has been added that gives you actually uh, the, the time uh, that you should take into account for this product. So four days for the vendor lead time, two days for the purchase security time, and one day 
to purchase. So the time frame that will be considered, it's between today and the 21st uh, of April. So if my product goes below uh, the quantity uh, before the 21st, uh, the reordering rule is going to be uh, triggered. So here, uh, for instance, what I can do is that uh, I can, of course, create a sales order, let's say for uh, three uh, units of the product that I just uh, created. And I'm going to set the delivery date as of the end of this week, meaning that it falls within uh, the time frame that I have set. And I'm going to uh, set another uh, sales order so that over the long run, my forecasted quantity goes below five. But at this stage, I'm going to set it uh, beyond 21st. So let's say on the 23rd, for instance, so the week after. Meaning that on the long run, indeed, my forecasted quantity will go below five, but within the time frame that I have set, uh, which takes into account the different lead times that I have, uh, it won't go below. And actually, I can show that by uh, simply uh, going back uh, in my uh, product form view. So if I open back uh, the product that I have uh, created, you can see here that over the long run, indeed, my forecasted quantity goes below five. But if I double check, uh, per week, it doesn't. It does go below ten, and it does go to seven on this Friday because of the first sales order that I created. But it will go below five on the twenty-third, meaning that here my reordering rule won't be triggered yet uh, because we are not falling within uh, the time range. So if I go on the min max and I activate uh, the minimum. Uh, stock rule and I run the scheduler, I shouldn't, I say I shouldn't have a request for quotation that would be created uh, for uh, my supplier Azer. So I will check here in the request for quotation that I don't have uh, the product in uh, the request of quote for quotation that were created. And as you can see here, the reordering rule was not triggered because I haven't gone yet. Uh, below the forecasted quantity within the time frame that is set. Of course, I can change that. Uh, and I actually, I can reuse one of the last sales orders that I created by duplicating this one. I will leave the quantity on three and I'm going to actually uh, set the delivery date as of, uh, let's say, on yeah, the 20th. So the delivery date is going to be on the 20th. So I confirm. And now, if I double check on my product, of course, on the long run, my forecasted quantity is even one. But uh, more importantly, uh, here, here it will go below uh, five on the 20th. So it me meaning that it will go before the 21st, below the minimum quantity set on the reordering rule, meaning that the reordering rule should be triggered in that situation. So if I run the scheduler here, uh, Odoo is going to trigger uh, a request for quotation for the product that I just created because I've gone below my forecasted quantity um, uh, before the 21st. So as you can see, uh, Odoo actually triggers um, the, the, the reordering rule uh, within the time frame and it avoids to have uh, too many quantities in stock uh, in advance, whereas the need is only um, located far uh, ahead in the future. So that's uh, a big advantage here because it helps you to keep a certain level of stock uh, over time uh, that is more uh, linear than it used to be uh, in the past because it, it used to look at the forecasted quantity, uh, the lowest forecasted quantity that you could have uh, in the future. So that's um, 
that's the the way now this new um, forecasting methodology uh, is applied. So that's about the reordering rules and the changes that uh, were applied. Uh, there. So the next topic that uh, was changed and optimized is the way we handle the margins uh, on the sales order, and especially when you use uh, products with a FIFO uh, costing method. So the way the cost appears on the FIFO product has changed. So let's see together uh, by changing and by creating first a new FIFO product uh, how it works uh, now. I don't know if you remember, but before, uh, in the previous versions, uh, the FIFO cost uh, was, um, uh, the, the cost of a FIFO product was updated uh, when the first product went out of the inventory. And even if you already had products uh, within the inventory, uh, it remained uh, at a zero cost until the first delivery uh, was made. Here, it won't be the case anymore. There will be a first update when you do your first uh, purchase of the product. So let's say, again, that I'm going to buy this product to uh, Ether for price of 10. I'm going to create a FIFO costing method uh, category that has as a costing method FIFO. So let me put the product in a FIFO category. And let me buy. Uh, so as you can see at this stage, it's still a cost of zero. And let me buy this product to the supplier for a cost of 10. So is a, the FIFO, let's say 10 units at a price of 10. I confirm my order. I validate my receipt. And if I double check again, my product that I just created. As you can see here, uh, the cost has no change to 10. So Odoo uh, uses, as soon as you have validated your first reset, the cost and the unit price that was applied on the purchase uh, and the first unit that is going to leave uh, the inventory. So if I now receive an extra batch of products uh, for another price. It's the main principle, of course, of having the product configured in FIFA is that you want to track the price of your products. And let's say that here I buy it at a price of 20 because there was a huge increase in the price of this product. I validate the receipt here. I validate the receipt, and if I double check on the product itself for the FIFO product, the cost remains 10. So the principle here is that the cost is updated as soon as you validate your first receipt, and it keeps the cost of the next product that is going to uh, leave the inventory here in that situation. We can double check, actually, if we go in the inventory and we have a look in the inventory valuation report for the product that I just created. We can check the value and we can see by looking at the layers that we actually have a different costing uh, for the different layers here. Now what's interesting to see is also the fact that there is an impact on the margin uh, that will be displayed on the sales orders with this new uh, behavior, and you will see that uh, the product owners uh, adapted the way it works on the sales order to compute the margin. So here I'm going to apply the margin on the sales. I'm going to go to the quotations, create a new quotation uh, for uh, this customer, and I can sell my product. And let's say that I'm going to uh, sell this one for uh, 15 units, I can display the margin on top of that. And let's say that I'm selling it at the price of 30. You will see here that uh, the way Odoo uh, evaluates my, uh, I would say my margin 
is at this stage only uh, influenced by uh, the cost that I have on my product. So it's an estimated cost. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the actual cost that I'm going to have for that delivery because here you can see I'm selling 15 units. I have 20 in stock, 10 at a price of 10, 10 at a price of 20, which means that I would have 10 at a price of 10, so 400, and 5 at the price of 20, so another 100. So it would be 200, uh, so my margin should be rather 250 here if it was uh, an actual margin. But here it's considering the fact that my 15 units are valued at a cost of 10, like the first units that I received. So my cost is 150 instead of 200. And my uh, selling price in total will be 450. So 450 minus 450, the current margin is in three. 300. So as you understand here, uh, when I do first my sales order, the margin that is displayed is using the cost price on the product, which is an estimate. But when I'll do the delivery of the 15 units with the actual price that will uh, be used for the delivery, you'll see that the margin will be updated. So I apply the delivery. And if I go back on the sales order here, you see that the margin has been adjusted because Odoo understands that we have delivered 10 units at 10, five units at 20. So my cost is now in total 200. So 450 minus 200, my margin should be 250. So there is an automated adjustment at the level of the sales order in terms of the margin, which is good because it actually takes into account the actual price and cost price at which you deliver the items. And if I go on the product itself, you'll see that now my product FIFO uses um, the cost of the last items that went out of my stock. So that's the new principle that is being applied and that's uh, more accurate and easier for the users to track the actual cost uh, of their product. A uh, small change that I could directly present here is the fact that um, we now have, uh, of course, still the on-end quantity, but we do not have any more the reserved quantity on the product. Uh, rather than that, we show the available quantity, which is kind of more interesting because it shows what is left to be sold to the customer that is not reserved yet. So it's um, more interesting for the salesperson to see that information. And as you can see here, you can see that my available quantity is five because nothing is reserved and I can still out of the five uh, on hand quantities that I have deliver five of them uh, for the next orders that will come. So if I uh, quickly create a sales order uh, for that one, you'll see here uh, that uh, the FIFO product, uh, if I sell one unit of this product, uh, and I go back onto the product, I will see that my available uh, quantity will be increased by one because now I have one product that is being reserved and I still have four units available to be uh, delivered to the customer. Okay, so that was the, the fourth point after the margins, the new quantity available on the product form. So that's a new way to uh, actually investigate the products that you have on end. Something that is very difficult for me to show but that I can quickly explain is the fact that now uh, it's way easier to do the import of the purchase order lines um, on, on, the, on the purchase orders. Because uh, as you know before, when we were importing a, a sales order with the lines, uh, there was an on change that would populate uh, the description, the unit price, the UM uh, of the line based on the product ID information. And this on change was triggered on the import. And that wasn't the case when you did such an import uh, with the purchase of the lines, meaning that even though you were mentioning uh, the product ID on the purchase of the lines, uh, you didn't have the on chain triggered. So the unit price was not computed, the subtotal was not computed, the taxes were not set, etc., etc., which was uh, very un inconvenient, meaning that you should actually do the import of all these fields, uh, of, of all these default fields, uh, even though they were already set on the product. And now, 
um, they decided to have such an on change on the purchase of the line. So it means that now if you want to import a, a purchase of the lines on a purchase order, you just have to mention the product ID and the quantities and the rest will be automatically uh, computed as you do the import. So that's really a, a great improvement that that were that was definitely needed when you think about it for for the imports. Also that's about the, the, the PO. Um, the two last points that I wanted to present was actually the fact that it's now uh, better handled uh, the quantity uh, increment that you would do on the purchase order, meaning that if you have a confirmed purchase order and you want to change the quantity um, that is ordered, you have uh, changes that will be populated not only on the first uh, move, but also on the next moves uh, in case you work uh, in a multi-steps uh, inbound process. So for that, I need, of course, to set up uh, my warehouse uh, in more than one step. So I'm going to uh, configure it in two steps. I'm going to create a purchase order for this uh, vendor. Let's say we can reuse my FIFO uh, product. Let's say that I, I order five units at the beginning. I have a first receipt for five units. And if I double check, of course, in my intermediary uh, moves in the inventory app, in the internal transfer, probably have this one, which is waiting. As you can see, I also have five units for this FIFA product here that is waiting. And a big change here is that if I go back on my purchase order, and if I actually find it here, edit it and change the ordered quantity on the purchase order, it will not only change the demand on my initial re receipt, but it will also change the initial demand on the next moves. Uh, so if I remove the ready one here, number four, you see that it has updated the demand on the next moves. This is something that wasn't the case before, uh, which means that now if you work in two or three steps in, uh, you will uh, more easily see uh, the changes applied if you do it um, at a higher level, like the PO uh, level, for instance. So that's an interesting change uh, that was brought here with SAS 13.2. Uh, and then uh, the last change that I wanted to mention is the fact that uh, you now have uh, the possibility I would say that's the first step because I'm sure some people uh, are still expecting uh, more from the unreserve um, feature, but you can actually now uh, do uh, unreserve in mass uh, several pickings that you'd like to unreserve. So for instance, let's say that uh, picking eight, nine and five, I want to unreserve them. I do not need any more to go uh, picking by picking, click the unreserved button. I can actually do it uh, with the action button uh, from the list view. So I can just click unreserved. And you can see that the tree that I have selected have just been unreserved. And I can use the products uh, that were reserved uh, for that purpose. So as you can see, um, there are quite some features here from the SAS 13.2. And I think there will be even more in the SAS 13.3. Uh, but as you can see, the main ones, I would say, uh, were located on the batch picking, which is no way easier to use uh, with the barcode app. You have also um, quite important changes when it comes to the purchase lead time and the way it interacts with the real world rules. Uh, the way also the costing uh, is impacting the margins uh, in FIFO has been changed and then you have some light improvements i would say like the quantity available the increment on the purchase order or the unreserved of several pickings at a time uh, that makes uh, life easier uh, by uh, being now accessible in the sas 13.2 so i thank you for your attention i hope you enjoyed these new features and let's see you uh, for another update on the sas 13.3